there was a woman who was waiting at the airport terminal for her plane. Now, as she sat reading her newspaper, before she sat down, she had purchased a package of cookies just to keep herself occupied and to enjoy while she waited for the plane. Now, she read her paper out of the corner of her eye. She could see that a man that was sitting right next to her was eating a cookie. So she looked down beside her and noticed her package of cookies had been opened and the man was eating one of them. Now, the woman couldn't believe that this guy would do such a thing, you know, be so bold as to start eating her cookies. But She decided, you know, I bought those cookies, I want some of them, so I'm just going to reach down and grab one so he knows those are my cookies. And so she ate one of her cookies. To her amazement, the man then reached down and grabbed another one and continued eating. Now this went on for a little while and eventually she got so irritated, she picked up the whole bag of cookies, emptied them into her hand, put one back in the bag and set it down and ate all the cookies out of her hand. The man reached down and grabbed the last cookie out of the bag, broke it in half, and gave her one half and ate the other. Now, at that point, she was enraged. The nerve of this guy, so she grabbed the bag, stood up, and shoved it in her purse and started walking away, and it was just then her hand hit her bag of cookies. To her shock, she noticed she was eating his cookies. Now, I love that story because it's a great example of human nature. And for us, what happens to us when we're judging other people, oftentimes? We can find ourselves in the wrong. We might just discover we're worse than those we accuse by attributing motives to their actions or qualities to their character that weren't there, that We created this story in our minds and tried to interpret and misjudge them. Now, this section fits into the previous context of Christian workers standing before the Lord, giving an account for how they served and their deeds being revealed by fire and what is left reveals the quality. And so um, within that context of one day standing before the Lord, Paul looks at the current situation that he's in where people have misjudged him in the Corinthian church. And so we see in the first two verses that Christ will commend those who serve faithfully. And so he begins by giving us a definition of what his role is and any leader in the church, what their role is. And he uses two words that we'll see, servants and stewards. But notice how he starts off. This is how one should regard us. This phrase to regard is a mathematical accounting term. It means to do the equation and come up with an answer. And so he's saying, this is how you guys ought to think about us. You know, put together all the parts, do the equation, and come up with the answer that gives you a proper opinion or view of who we are. And so once you do the math, this is what it all comes down to. Um, People err on two sides of that answer oftentimes. Either their answer after the equation is too big or it's too small. You know what it's like in math class. Um, And you find out you got the wrong answer. It was too big or too small. Now, we often err on one of two sides in how we regard leaders. Either we consider them too small, too less than we should, which this did happen to Paul. In 2 Corinthians 10.10, you can see just how brutal the Corinthians could be to him. He's quoting what they're saying about him. It says, for they say his letters are weighty and strong, but his bodily presence is weak and his speech is of no account. Man, that's harsh. You know, he doesn't look very manly or strong or important. And besides that, he's boring, you know. He puts you to sleep. 
And so they were looking at Paul in a way that was too low, too small. But then there were those that were looking at him as being too large, too important. 1 Corinthians 1.13, when he made this point, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? He's like, I'm not your savior. Jesus is. So make sure let's keep our eyes on him. And so there's the error that people often make, either making the later too big or too small. And Paul's trying to bring them to a right assessment, to the right answer at the end of the equation. And so it has two parts. Number one, he goes, you know, you ought to consider us not your saviors and, you know, not somebody to be despised, but rather servants. Literally, this word for servant here is under rower. Now, maybe you've seen some old movies of those big galley ships with the guys all with oars sitting in rows, uh, rowing and moving the ship along. Uh, that's exactly what an under rower is, to be one of those guys in the belly of the ship. And so here they had these Roman ships with under rowers that provided the power to move the ships with precision during battle. And so the way that this occurred is that the captain would stand above the men and give the orders about where to row. And so these under rowers were free men, but they followed the direction of their captain. And together, the captain led them somewhere. Now, figuratively, our master is Christ. And so Paul's saying, we are under rowers. All of us apostles are on equal footing, and we're here rowing together. All Christian leaders are rowing together, in a sense, alongside of one another. But we have our eyes on the master. And when he tells us, go forward, we go forward. Or backwards, we go backwards. Or steady, we stay steady. Or slow, we go slow. And so... Jesus is the Lord of his church, and leaders follow his lead, follow his instruction, and he directs his church. And so that's a really cool picture of how leadership's supposed to work in the body of Christ. We're all, when it comes down to it, servants of Christ, you know, not just pastors. Um, and in your life, there's a lot of voices that would like to tell you what to do. Go this way, go that way. You know, you hear them all week long. But Christ is your captain, and that's the voice you need to cue in on. And listen, and follow his lead. Serve as he directs. And so Paul's like, you know, I got my eyes set on Christ. I'm doing what he tells me to do. I'm an under rower. And so that first illustration has to do with Christ's authority over the leader following his lead, his direction. But the second illustration we see here has to do with the leader's authority within Christ's family. And so he uses another word, the word stewards, which we don't really have many situations where we have a um, comparable example of this in our society. But back then, there was a head servant over a household that would have the delegated responsibility from the master or owner of that household to take care of his children, his estate, and other servants. And so it was like being the head of the household when the master wasn't around or so that the master didn't have to do every little task, um, a steward. It was also a title used for the treasurer of a city, you know, overseeing how money was spent within a city. So to be a steward points to that delegated authority over the master's house. And in this case, apostles, leaders are given that authority to take care of God's children, take care of God's stuff, you know, take care of God's reputation and, and whatnot, his glory, um, not their own. 
And so here, specifically, stewards of the mysteries of God. And we talked about what the mysteries of God refers to, the, the wisdom of God hidden throughout the ages. The gospel as it played out in history, God's redemption story that began way back in Genesis 1, and you can see the, the ending of it at the end of Revelation. The theme of scripture is redemption. So the mystery is how would God redeem mankind? You know, as you read all the stories of sin, all the stories of failure. Um, well, God sent his one and only son. Nobody expected that. And he died on the cross for our sins. Nobody expected that. And he rose from the dead and nobody expected that. And so it was a mystery till it was revealed. And so God's plan of redemption revealed through all of scripture, revealed in the person of Christ and now actively being revealed by the Holy Spirit. This is the stewardship of any pastor or leader to present the whole counsel of God's word in the context of the gospel. In Acts 20, 26 through 27, Paul said this. I think it gives a picture of what it means to be a steward of the mysteries of God. He said, therefore, I testify to you this day that I am innocent of the blood of all, for I did not shrink from declaring to you the whole counsel of God. So God, in a sense, leaves leaders in charge to make sure everybody's fed with his word and that they're connected with the master. Now, he says here, it's required of servants that they be found faithful. Servants need to be found faithful by their master. And especially if they go on a long trip and then come home, they want to find their household in order. Christ gives us a number of illustrations or stories, parables about this very scenario. The, greatest respons the great responsibility that comes with this role of being a steward. And in Matthew 24, verse 45, he says, who then is the faithful and wise servant whom his master has set over his household to give them their food at the proper time? Notice that's one of those roles that they have is to feed the people, the workers, the, the children. Blessed is the servant whom his master finds so doing when he comes. Truly, I say to you, he will set him over all his possessions but if that wicked servant says to himself, my master's delayed, he begins to beat his fellow servants and eats and drink with drunkards, the master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and in an hour when he does not know and will cut him in pieces and put him with the hypocrites. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So the story gives us the reality of accountability with that responsibility. And so one day the master will return and all stewards will give an account. But this level of accountability is why leaders need to be valued in the church. Why the Corinthians should be valuing Paul and why we value those in authority over us. In Hebrews 13, 17, it says in this context, obey your leaders and submit to them for they are keeping watch over your souls like stewards in a household, like a shepherd of the flock. And, so, and those who will have to give an account, the master's gonna come back one day. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning for that would be of no advantage to you. You know, it's not gonna be easier for everybody if, if things get um, dramatic, you know, if drama takes over. So here the Corinthians needed to learn to not value Paul too much, but not too little. And so let that be a lesson to us in our relationship with our leaders, with those over us. I, mean, I think all of us should be people under authority. And so Ultimately, Christ is the head. Now, 
When we think about stewards being faithful, I think oftentimes we miss that it's so important that we're faithful with the little things first. In the same way that we're all servants of Christ, we're all, in a sense, stewards. God has given us a life. He's given us a family or abilities or finances or giftings or whatever it is. We're all stewards of what God has delegated to us. Now, being faithful with the little things, Scripture tells us that those who are faithful with the little things will be entrusted with more things, you know? It's the little things that really make your character um, stronger and reveals who you really are, you know? If we only do the things that people notice or the things that seem like big things and we forsake the little things, then we're not being good stewards. With regards to sharing the gospel, with regards to teaching the word of God, that stewardship increases in seriousness um, to this point where Paul encourages Timothy in 1 Timothy 4.16, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching or the gospel, the, the word of God. Persist in this for by so doing, you will save both yourselves and your hearers. That's pretty serious stuff to keep a close watch on how you live and what you teach. The Texas Army National Guard has a group of special workers called riggers. It's their job to fold the pack of, and fold and pack the parachutes in, in the uh, backpack so that when the soldiers jump from the airplane from 5,000 feet, these chutes will be faithful or trustworthy to open. So um, they're super dedicated to their task because they know people's lives are on the line. So they have what's called the Riggers Creed that states, I will be sure always. They know jumpers need assurance that everything regarding their shoots is going to be trustworthy, perfect. In the 20 minutes it takes to meticulously pack an MC1 military parachute, 30 folds are required. Now, by the time the jumper has it on his, his or her back and is getting ready to jump out of the plane, they've had nothing to do with that shoot until that moment. And so they have to trust the air-free performance of the riggers. It's all they have to rely on is their integrity. And so the riggers' creed further states, I will never let the idea that a piece of work is good enough make me a potential murderer through a careless mistake or oversight, for I know there can be no compromise with perfection. So riggers know that the parachute is a business of life or death. Mistakes cost lives. And um, those in leadership are in a similar situation that mistakes cost lives. You know, we, we can't preach a false gospel. We can't live a false life. We have to have both. Be faithful. Actually, I have one of my good friends who had a double parachute malfunction and he literally died, but they brought him back um, and now he's legally blind, but he's alive, you know, it's really good, but <laughs> it's interesting to hear his stories and so important, you know, somebody takes care of you um, and especially leaders. So if we're not faithful w w with what we've been entrusted with, people are going to get hurt. If you're not faithful in the little things, God doesn't entrust you with more. And so, are you being a faithful steward? Well, in verses three through five, it goes on. We are not the ones, or this is my second point, <laughs> we are not the ones who will ultimately commend or condemn Christ's servants. We are not the judge. So in verse three, it says, but with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. 
In fact, I do not even judge myself, for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. When Paul starts off and says this phrase, but with me it's a very small thing. I think Paul must have been way more mature than most of us because when people question our actions, our motivations, our character, or even our abilities, doesn't it make you mad? When somebody accuses you or puts you under the microscope, it's human nature to get upset. Have you ever lost sleep because a coworker has become critical or you're under the microscope? You know, just that tossing and turning. Oh, I can't believe they think that or said that. You ever been there before? Well, I'm sure Paul had those times, but he's learned something I think we all need to learn. With me, it's a very small thing. What people think about me is a very small thing compared to what God thinks about me, which is a very big thing. We need to learn that freedom in fearing God and not man. You know, it'll save you from all sorts of anxiety, sleepless nights, mental problems. I mean, all sorts of things that happen. When we get focused on fickle people all around us saying whatever they say, it can really mess you up. And it could really make you do some things. You'd look back and say later, wow, that was not very wise. Or say things that aren't very wise. In 1 Peter 2.23, we see how Christ dealt with being accused wrongly, with being yelled at and spit on and shamed in 1 Peter 2.23. When he was reviled, well, they were like spitting on him and yelling at him. He did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. You know, Paul learned that example of, it's a very small thing to me what people think about me. It's a very big thing about what God thinks about me. And then Christ set for us the ultimate example by learning to entrust his heart, entrust his reputation, entrust his affirmation, his emotions to him who judges justly. How are you doing with learning that lesson? I don't know about you guys, but I have to relearn that lesson. Like every time, it seems, maybe not every time, but it seems like every time a new situation happens. And I have to put that situation back before the Lord and actively trust him and find that peace and find that freedom. Well, Paul found it. And what he says is, I don't care if you guys judge me. And that word here means to, when we speak of judging, means to engage in careful examination, investigation, or criticism in order to determine the excellence or defects of someone. You ever been judged under the microscope? Paul says, I don't care if I'm judged by you or even a human court. Now, that's pretty intense. I've never been to court personally. I can't imagine that would be a very peaceful experience being called in and to stand before the judge. But Paul says, you know, these things don't cause me angst. These things don't rock my world because my foundation is on trusting God. Because that day that's coming that I'll stand before him is gonna be the greatest day, you know, the greatest day to worry about, if you will, or to look forward to. But the courtroom of public opinion is a very cruel place. 
In our day and age, we talk about cancel culture. There's no forgiveness in cancel culture. But that's not how God works. Jesus Christ was canceled for you. You know, I mean, that, that's the gospel. He took condemnation for you. He paid the price for you. But we can stand in that confidence no matter what kind of cancel culture you find yourself in. The people that judge you judge by mere appearances. They judge by perception, not the truth. Their judgment is fickle and short-lived whether it be right or wrong, oftentimes the judgment of men is without forgiveness. But praise be to God, he gives more grace, right? That he is merciful. Um, so what kind of judge do we face? Well, the ultimate judge, and he's a merciful God, and he loves you. But Paul says this, I don't even judge myself which is a pretty intense thing to say because I know my first reaction when I'm judged is to defend myself, you know, is to come up with all the reasons why the person's wrong, um, all the reasons why I'm right. Well, the reason why Paul doesn't judge himself is because he's not aware of anything against himself. He's, he's biased towards himself. Um, So in order to be in that place where we don't even judge ourselves, we gotta realize we're biased and it's best to probably let God defend you instead of trying to defend yourself and to remain teachable because the reality may be that you have a blind spot in that God wants to show you something. I mean, even though your conscience is clear, like Paul could say, hey, my conscience is clear, but I don't, I don't judge myself because I've learned over time. I can be wrong. And so, being teachable is so important. God, show me my blind spots. Show me the things that I don't see. We might even have a wrong evaluation of God, saying, well, God's okay with this. And so we make our conscience clear by redefining who God is. But then when we read scripture and we discover who he really is, and then we go, oh, maybe God's not okay with this. So be careful about trying to justify yourself because you're not going to be your own judge. That's why he ends with this. It's the Lord who judges me. I'm not gonna judge myself and people around me aren't gonna judge me. God is gonna judge me. So he is the audience we should be living for. It's his thoughts about us that should be the big thoughts. The thoughts that rock our world or give us great confidence. Judgment is always God's prerogative. And here we're speaking specifically of the judgment that Christians will experience where we stand before the Lord, not an issue of going to hell or heaven, as is often portrayed uh, in movies or cartoons or whatever it may be, but rather those who have trusted in Christ will stand before Jesus to give an account of their life. In 2 Corinthians 5.10, it says this, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So it will be a judgment of rewards or no rewards. Like in the last chapter, is somebody, um, when their works are tested by fire, there'll be a lot of um, enduring treasures left over, or they'll be entering heaven like one escaping from the flames, you know? So we're talking about the condition in which we will enter heaven. Now there is a different judgment called the great white throne judgment in Revelation, and that is one of condemnation where people are sent into the lake of fire. You know, if you're in that judgment, it's not good news. But we face a different judgment in Christ, 
In 1 Peter 1.17, it says, and if you call on him as father who judges impartially, according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. With fear. One of the easiest ways for me to understand the fear of the Lord is to contrast it with the fear of man. When I fear man, I make what they think about me really big. When I fear God, what he thinks about me makes what man thinks about me look like nothing, you know. I put his affirmation ahead of anybody else in my life. And so in verse five, it continues on. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Do not pronounce judgment before the time. Man, we think we're pretty good judges of people, don't we? Oftentimes we're pronouncing judgments all throughout the day. On the road, we're pronouncing judgments. On our neighbors, we're pronouncing judgments on our brothers and sisters at church, whatever it is. I mean, we're thinking these things and it's not good. We kind of learn to attribute motivations to people's actions when we lack the full story, we create one in our own minds and it's often worse than reality. Have you ever been in that place where you've created a narrative about somebody in the absence of accurate information and then finally later on you learn the truth and you're like, oh, phew. you know, like the lady with the cookies. <laughs> you're stuck with feeling like the jerk at the end, you know? Well, personally, I've been reading through uh, the book of Job, which is always a great encouraging book to read, but <laughs> one of the things I noticed at the end is there, there's a guy, Elihu, um, who, he's not one of the three friends, he's this guy who's been watching the whole time, and then he kind of speaks wisdom at the end. And it's funny, after he's listened to all their arguments, you know, Job's defending himself, you know? He's being defensive. And then his three friends are accusing him and trying to come up with reasons why all this bad stuff is happening. And then Elihu comes in and he kind of represents God's heart here. It says, then Elihu, the son of Barakel, the Buzzite, you know the Buzzites, right? <laughs> of the family of Ram, burned with anger. He's, he's watching these guys and they're all older than him. And he's like, oh, you guys are driving me nuts. He burned with anger at Job because he justified himself rather than God. And he burned with anger at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, though they had declared Job to be in the wrong. I think this is how the younger generation sometimes feels as they watch the church. That we can, we're really good at defending ourselves and we're really good at declaring people to be in the wrong. We can wrongly commend when we don't know the full story or we can wrongly criticize not knowing the full stories. Romans 14.4 says this, who are you to pass judgment on the servant of another? It is before his own master that he stands or falls. He will be upheld for the Lord is able to make him stand. That's humbling. When we're called onto the floor, you know, who are you to be questioning God's servant? He's gonna stand before God one day and that's enough. You know, he or she doesn't need you to be their judge. Now, there are times when we need to exhort and confront, um, encourage and rebuke and all those things, but 
First taking the plank, of course, out of our own eye. Or taking the bag of cookies out of our purse. <laughs> um, first. But what God will do is really interesting. Now, he's going to shine the light into the dark places that nobody can see, and that has to do with our motivations. The motivation behind the actions. There's a lot of things that we do for the Lord that I believe at times have mixed motivations, you know? We want to bless people, we want to serve God, but then it gets kind of mixed sometimes with self-service and pride, self-importance, you know? One day God's going to like shine the light and show you what was behind stuff. So believe me, you got enough in your own life to be worried about to not be thinking of everybody else when it comes to motivations. In 1 Samuel 16, 7, it says, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look on his appearance or the height of his stature because I have rejected him. Speaking of one of David's brothers, for the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. The things you cannot hide from God, your heart, your motivation, those things do matter. But oftentimes we switch it around. It's the appearance that matters. It's the appearance of success. It's the appearance of results. It's the appearance of doing good without dealing with our heart issues, you know? And so it's with our motivations and our faithfulness to the little things that God is going to have in mind when he judges us. And it's then that he gives us commendation. I like this word. The act of expressing approval, praise, or recognition for an excellent performance. Commendation. God has built us with that desire for approval. And from the time we're little kids, you know, we experience that desire for approval. When we're in a play or a concert, our parents are out there clapping, you know? That approval is so encouraging and uplifting. Um, the desire for recognition and praise is something that God has built into our hearts, but it's not so that we would find it from man. It's so that we would find it from him. So understand that desire is not bad, but how you direct it determines everything. When we desire to, be com com to receive commendation, approval from God, that is where that desire finds its fulfillment and its joy. In Matthew 6, 1, it says, beware of practicing your, practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. And that's the way things work in reality. You know, you're going to put all of your eggs in one basket or the other. There's no in between, you know. Serving for God or serving for man. You know, I'd encourage you to learn to let go of that approval of people. Give up that desire for earthly commendation because you know what? It only lasts for that day or that moment. But when God rewards you, that heavenly commendation will be for eternity. Well, in verse six through seven, we see this wrap up for today. The third point, recognize faithful servants by using scriptural standards. If you're really going to um, not see your leaders as too low or too high, and you're also going to be able to um, 
look to God as the judge and not be the judge yourself. We, it says in verse six that Paul applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. Brothers, that you may learn from us not to go beyond what is written, that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. I think it was kind of kind for Paul to apply this to himself and Apollos and not rake the leaders over the coals that were causing division. You know, he didn't call their names out. He didn't shame them. He showed them positive examples of a servant and a steward, an under rower and a household manager to move people forward. And so when you see this phrase, do not go beyond what is written, it's speaking of not thinking of any person beyond what God's word says about people. To not assess a leader based on things that aren't scriptural. And so this kind of hits to the heart of a lot of what happens in the church today because many people will assess a leader on things that are not scriptural. For example, their personality or humor, their physical appearance, their eloquence, their education, their pedigree, their family connections, their knowledge. I think it's inter interesting to me that they did the same thing to John the Baptist. They did the same thing to the apostles. The world was like, man, these guys are weird and they're unimportant, unimpressive, uneducated. But they're the very guys that God chose. You know, so we don't go beyond what is written when we assess what is good leadership, what is bad leadership. We, we stick to scripture and we'll keep ourselves out of a whole load of trouble um, sticking to what has been written for us. And people have always struggled with exalting leaders to an unhealthy point. And so Jesus even confronts this in Matthew 23, 8. He says, but you are not to be called rabbi for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. Notice that. One teacher, Jesus Christ. Everybody else is all brothers. Matthew 23, 10. Neither be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Christ. So what is written? You know, we're all on equal footing before Jesus Christ. He is our Lord. And if anybody is gifted or called to a position of leadership, it's not because they have more value than any of their brothers or sisters. It's because God needs somebody fulfill, to fulfill a role. He'll be glorified all the more by choosing somebody people don't expect, you know? So, that none of you may be puffed up, it says. Puffed up literally means to inflate, you know? Um, but figuratively, it's that false size that we create when we think of ourselves higher than we are. You know, we, we think we're bigger than we are. Prideful motivations can puff us up. It reminds me of being a, a little yapper dog, you know, little white little dogs. I actually had a nightmare that we adopted a little white fluffy dog. Sorry if you like those. They're really cute and everything, but I was like, what am I doing with this little dog? Where's, where's Lovey? Where's my, my bigger dog, you know? But it's funny, you know, those little dogs, uh, they have huge hearts, you know? They have big egos oftentimes. They think they're way bigger than they are. And they bark really loud, they bark really fast, and once in a while they learn that they're not as big as they are, but usually not. You know, God doesn't want us to be puffed up. 
He doesn't want us to be like little yapper dogs. In verse 7, for who sees anything different in you? What do you have that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as though you did not receive it? And so he asks three rhetorical questions that pop the bubble of their pride. I love that when scripture does that. You know, oh, you thought you were that? You know, and whew. It happens to me all the time when I read the word. It's a good thing. One time we were at this camp and there was a massive lightning storm um, throughout the night. And it was cool. I love lightning storms, you know. Um, you could just hear one after another after another and the, lo- the room would light up from the flashes of lightning and whatnot. But it was funny, the next morning, talking to the youth pastor of our youth group, you know, we were at a camp with all kinds of kids from all over the place. And he was like, last night during the storm, it was hilarious. There was this kid on his balcony and every time lightning went off in thunder, he would go like this. And then there was thunder and he'd go like that. And he, he was acting like he was in charge of orchestrating the thunderstorm. You know, nothing he possessed gave him control over that thunderstorm. And that's kind of what Paul is saying here. Why do you boast as though you're doing this? Because anything you do that's going to be miraculous or powerful or eternal in nature comes from me. He is the one that sends the lightning and the thunder. And so Paul asks them, what, what makes you different? Why, why are you any better than anybody else? Don't boast about it. Boasting means to take the glory. Take the glory. Like that kid. Oh, he thought he had power. And he was like looking at his hands apparently. Oh, he was taking in the glory. Our gifting comes from God, and to him be the glory. In Psalm 115, verse 1, it says, Not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. And in heaven, we see the same. Revelation 4.11. Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. Wow. When we take the glory, it's a shameful thing. Give all glory to him. And so you can see Paul continuing to instill in the Corinthians a healthy view of leadership and a humility when it comes to serving the Lord. And so as we apply this, a couple things to remember. Number one, remain faithful with what you've been entrusted with because one day the master will come and he will ask, how did you lead your family? How did you represent me at work? How did you love your wife? How did you love your husband? One day we will give an account. So remain faithful. Number two, live for an audience of one. If what people think about you has become so big it keeps you up at night, it's time to change something. You know, it's time to get right and learn to fear the Lord. To look for his affirmation, his applause, for his look of approval. And then lastly, rediscover a scriptural view of yourself and others. Scripture has a way of grounding you 
in giving you that humility that you need. The further we go without spending time in the word, I can guarantee you probably the further your mind goes into the realm of being puffed up with pride. Or maybe you go the other direction and you beat yourself down into a pulp (laughs) when God wants to lift you up and he wants to bring the prideful down. Rediscover that scriptural view of yourself and others. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for your word and just how you give us the truth, the perspective from eternity. And we offer ourselves up to you, Lord. We entrust ourselves to you as the one who judges justly, the one who is merciful and patient, who knows all our failures and still loves us who is a God of second chances. God, we just come before you and we pray that you would instill in us that fear of you to care about what you think, to long for that look of approval and that you would orientate our whole mind, actions, attitudes to be looking to you, our captain, to be looking to you, our master. And we give you this week, Lord, help us to live this out. In Jesus' name, amen.